Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Today I'm going to uh, talk about Jesus' promise to build his church. Jesus' promise to build his church. And next week we're going to look at uh, Jesus' plan to build his church. How Jesus, what's Jesus' plan for doing that. And then uh, the next few weeks after that we're going to look at Acts 2. 41 through 47 about the early church and what the early church looked like, what we can learn from the early church. So uh, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. And I, I, um, I typically preach out of the ESV, that's the English Standard Version, but you're welcome to follow along in any translation. But this is, uh, I think Mark's got it up there for us. Um, but Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. It says, the, the Bible says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and on the gate and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the word uh, church, uh, is, it comes from, like, basically it, it comes from two uh, Greek words. It, it, but the Greek word is ekklesia. I don't know a lot of Greek words, but that's one I know because this is really important. Ekklesia. And it, uh, the ek means to call out or out, to come out. And then um, the, the second part, kaleo, so ekklesia, the called out ones. So Jesus is saying the church uh, are the called out ones. And, and it's just a gathering or an assembly is what the, ch- the word church actually means. So whenever, we're, whenever we, we're gathered together, we're assembled in the name of Jesus. And... Uh, the word church is actually, Jesus only uses the, he only uses the word church three times. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus only says the word church three times. And this is the first place uh, in the Bible where we see the word church. And Jesus here, when he says he will build his church, he's talking about the universal church. And the universal church is the church that is all Christians at, it, at all times and in all places. So th- this is the local church. Union Baptist Church is a, is a local church body. But we, all, we know that there's also many churches around here and all over the world that we would... Uh, now, some churches are, are not true churches, and we can talk, we'll, we'll get into that. But um, in a few weeks, probably, we'll see what defines like a true church. But this is a local church body. We gather in Jesus' name. And together with all other local church bodies that worship Jesus, that makes up the universal church, right? And so that's what Jesus is talking about when he says, I will build my church. He's talking about the universal church. Uh, Because we know that Jesus doesn't lie. We know that, uh, you know, churches have failed, right? Churches do die out. So obviously, um, you know, he's talking about the universal church, the church at large. Um, But he... I want us to see what we can learn uh, right here in the first mention of the church. And when Jesus mentions that he says, I will build my church, what can we learn about what the church is? One, of the, uh, one church that Bethany and I were a part of uh, several years ago, the pastor, he, uh, he liked to say that he said one of the most undertaught doctrines in the church is the doctrine of the church. And I thought, how great. How And, and then... Um, you know, some people, like I've read some books, and they would say, before you can plant a church, you have to know what a church is, right? Before you can uh, be a decent pastor of a church, you have to know what a church is. And so we're going to look at that in the next few weeks. But uh, the first thing 
that we see. Well, let's, let's pray, and then we'll, we'll jump into the text. So, Father, we do thank you once again for allowing us to gather together in your name. We thank you for the men and women that have laid down their lives to give us the opportunity to do so. God, we pray for their families as they uh, remember lost loved ones today. We pray you'd give them comfort and peace. And God, I thank you for these people that have come together in your name. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, help me to clearly and ex- um, clearly explain the scriptures, to be faithful to your word. And God, I pray that people would be encouraged um, and challenged if, if necessary, God. So we pray your Holy Spirit would help us to understand. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So Jesus says, or uh, the text says in verse 13 that Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi and he was with his disciples. Now Caesarea Philippi uh, was a town that's about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee and this was a place of worship for uh, the Canaanite god Baal. And that's little g, little god Baal. But y'all remember, y'all probably remember um, the Israelites running into, into the Canaanites in the Old Testament. And so they, there was a, a place of worship for Baal. The Greeks had turned it in a, into a place to worship Pan, which was the god of fertility. And then there was a new temple built for the emperor Caesar. And so this, is, this town, Caesarea Philippi, is kind of a melting pot of different religions. There's the Greek god, there's the worship of the emperor Caesar, there's the Canaanite god Baal, and here Jesus has his disciples, and he's with them, and he, uh, he's trying to teach, he's trying to see, have the disciples, of course Jesus knew the answer, but he's seeing, do the disciples really understand who I am? Do they really know who I am? See, we live in a global world. You guys probably all know that. Uh, we, we buy things online, or at least I do. Bethany and I buy a lot of things online. And, uh, you know, or you, you can go to Walmart or wherever it is you shop and you buy stuff and you see made in. And it may be the U.S. or it may be China or it may be Taiwan or wherever. We live in a global world. And we, especially here in America, we have, um, we have a, a lot of different religions and uh, we, many want to downplay the, relig- the differences between religions. They want to say, well, you know, Muslims and Jews and Christians, they worship the same God. And a lot of people would want to say that. But Jesus, it's like Jesus, he brings his disciples to this very religious place. And he says, who do you, and he, he asks, who does the people say that I am and who do you say that I am? So Jesus is intentional here. Uh, this would be like us going to um, say if, I don't know El Dorado real well yet. I know some of the eating places. That's about it so far. But say there was a a Hindu temple and a Buddhist temple and an Islamic mosque. And Jesus would say, Jesus brought us right down and maybe they were all in the same place. And he asked us, who do you say that I am? Jesus is, is really intentional. So in verse 13, he says, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that the son of man is? And verse 14, and they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. See, Jesus was seen, so the disciples had perceived that the people, that the crowds that had kind of come to listen to Jesus or that were hearing about Jesus, everyone perceived that Jesus was a religious figure, right? All of those are, are religious figures, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, so everybody can sense that Jesus, he's proclaiming a religious message. He's proclaiming the word of God. But they haven't commit, But the crowds have not um, figured out that Jesus is the son of God. But then Jesus, he gets personal. He says to them, but who do you say that I am? And that you there in verse 15 is plural. It's emphatic. Jesus is wanting, he's asking all of his disciples, well, who do you say that I am? See, the, the crowds, they thought he was, a, they, they thought, well, he's at least a prophet or a religious figure. And there's a lot of people today, virtually no one denies that Jesus came and that he lived, that he was born, that he lived for a certain period of time and that he died. No, virtually no one refutes that. But a lot of people say that Jesus, what, he was a good teacher or he was a good man. 
but they deny that the resurrection was true. They deny that Jesus was the actual Son of God. That They just say, well, Jesus was a good teacher. He was a good man. He's somebody that we can learn something from. We can learn some principles, but he's not really the Son of God. Uh, Gandhi, he had a quote that said, you know, I love, or he says, I like your Jesus, but I do not like your church. I don't like the Christians, I like, but I like Jesus. There's a lot of people that have a lot of respect for Jesus, but they don't bow down to him as Lord and Savior, as the Son of God. But he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? That's the most important question that you could ever be asked is, um, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Who do you say that Jesus is? Their question of Jesus' identity... See, the disciples are kind of figuring out... Um, they've, they've seen Jesus do some amazing things. Uh, in Matthew 8, 27... Um, Mark is going to put some of these on the screen. But in Matthew 8, 27... Whenever Jesus told the storm to stand still, this is what they said. The men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? See, Jeremiah couldn't do that. The prophets couldn't do that. And the disciples had perceived that this, this man, that the, the sea and the winds obey him. And then Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. John the Baptist, he had... Uh, it says, now John, when John, that's John the Baptist, heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples. And then verse 3. And said to him, are you the one, talking to Jesus, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? So the word is spread. And, Je and so you had the disciples see that Jesus has, he can calm the storms. And John the Baptist says, are you the one that we're looking for? Are you the Messiah? We've heard what's going on. We've heard how you can heal the sick and make the blind to see. We've heard these things. Are you the one that we're looking for? And then Matthew chapter 12, verse 23. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? This is after Jesus cast out demons. So, verse 16, Peter responds... Simon Peter, so Peter, um, he was kind of the spokesman for the disciples. He was one that spoke out a lot, and sometimes he spoke well, sometimes it wasn't so well, but he was the guy that was going to speak out. He was the leader of the disciples, and he replies and says in verse 16, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Peter responds rightly. He says, You are the Christ. And Christ, the word Christ, that's not Jesus' last name, but it means anointed one, the chosen one, the Messiah. As, as John the Baptist said, are you the one that is to come? Are you the one that we're looking for? And he is. See, how, who you say Jesus is will determine everything about how you follow him. If you think he's just a good teacher or a good person, then you may keep living how you've always lived and you may just... Pick up some things from the Bible and that Jesus said, like for instance, the golden rule, treat others how you would like to be treated in Matthew 7, 12. Well, who doesn't, who doesn't say that's a good idea, right? A lot of people would say, well, that's great. I can take that from Jesus. I can apply that to my life. But they don't surrender to Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus, in verse 17, he answers Peter and he says, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So Peter has rightly said who Jesus is. He says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, you're blessed, Peter. You're blessed, Simon Bar-Jonah. And what that just simply means is son of John. In, in uh, John, verse, or John chapter 1, verse 42, we see that Peter's dad, his name is, is uh, John. And so he's saying, Jesus is saying, Peter, you've told me who I am. Now let me tell you who you are. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. A true understanding of Jesus comes not from 
uh, human invention, but from divine revelation. See, the Holy Spirit helped Peter to understand who Jesus is, that he truly is the Son of God. So the church, I only have two points this morning. And the first point is this. The church is a community of people who know Jesus intimately. The church is a community of people who know Jesus intimately. See, the crowds, they knew Jesus as a good teacher or a prophet. But the disciples, they knew Jesus as a son. They truly knew Jesus for who he is. And he's the son of the living God. He is the Messiah. So as a church, now this is the universal church, but obviously as a local church, our first job as Christians and as a church is to know Jesus, right? That's, our, that's what bonds us together or should bond us together is that we believe in Jesus, that we understand that Jesus is the Son of God that came. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life. He, he, um, he lived the life that we were supposed to live and died the death that we were supposed to die, right? He came and took. He lived a perfect life. He went to the cross. He took, as, as we sang in, in Christ alone, he took God's wrath upon himself. The wrath that was to be poured out for our sins, God poured it out on him. And then if we res re uh, respond in repentance and faith, that we can know Jesus, that we can know God because of what Jesus has done. So the, the church is the community of people who know Jesus intimately, that know him for who he is. But not only that, but the church is the community of people who proclaim Jesus confidently. Look at verse 18. Jesus says, he continues, and he says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So Jesus makes this promise. He says, I will build my church. So it doesn't matter what, uh, what laws are passed and what uh, people say we can or can't say or can or can't do or in... Um, in many other countries, people that are Christians are persecuted, people that are being killed. Actually, uh, Christian persecution is, at a, is, a, is higher now than it has ever been in the world, whether or not you can believe that or not. And, um, but Jesus says no matter what governments do, no matter what other people from other religions do, no matter what happens in this world, he says, I will build my church. You see, the power of Christ he says I will build it see Jesus has all authority in Matthew 28 in his last words to his disciples in the great commission he says this uh, in Matthew 28 18 he says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me see Jesus has all authority all authority Jesus has and then he said he keeps going he says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I've got this memorized in a different translation. And teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So Jesus says, I have all authority. And then he says, I want you to go and to go, to baptize, and to teach. And then he says, and I'll be with you always to the very end of the earth. So Jesus has all authority. He, the power of Christ. Then you see the possession of Christ. He says, I will build what church? He says, I will build my church. See, the church belongs to Jesus. The church is what? The bride of Christ. We see that in Ephesians 5. But the church belongs to Jesus. And I, again, I'm speaking the universal church, but also local churches belong to Jesus. See, the church is, the, this church, the Union Baptist Church, is not my church. It's not the deacon's church. It's not even... In some sense, it's not even your church, but it's what? It's Jesus' church, but we're members of it. And I'm not saying you can't say that's my church, you can, but what I mean is that Jesus, ultimately the church belongs to Jesus, right? Acts 20, 28, Jesus, it says that, uh, that God or Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. See, I didn't go and die on the cross for anybody's sins, but Jesus did. He went and died on the cross for our sins. He purchased the church. There would be no church without Jesus' death on the cross. We would just all be headed for hell because there would be no, there would not be a, a sacrifice that would be there for our sins. So the church is Jesus' church. And then lastly, the people of Christ, I will build my church. 
the church is made up of the people who know Jesus rightly, that he is the Son of God. That's what we just talked about in the last few verses. The people that know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. See, people, it doesn't, or it doesn't matter that you are attending church. We don't really attend church, but I know why we say that. Uh, we attend a gathering, we attend a worship gathering where the church is made up, right? But we, uh, it doesn't matter that you're here this morning or that you may even be a member, uh, that you were baptized or whatever. What matters is that, we, are, that we've, we know who Jesus is, that we've surrendered to him in repentance and faith. And that he's in the, that we it doesn't matter if you are just a member of the local church, if you've not truly if you don't truly know who Jesus is and you're not a, a part of the actual church, does that make sense? I'm getting some blank stares, but um, what I'm saying is church membership does not guarantee a place in heaven, but only knowing Jesus correctly, that he is the Son of God, that he is who he says he is, that we've surrendered him to him as Lord. The gates of, when Jesus says the gates, he says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's talking about the death or particularly the power of death. If you think about what a gate does, a gate... So back in the day, uh, cities had, uh, they had walls around them for protection. They had gates. That was how you let people in and out of the city. So the gates were seen as the power of the city because that gave you... Whoever controlled the gates had, gave you the power to come in or out of the city. And so he says the power... Or he says, the gates of hell, or Hades, will not prevail against it. So not even death. Jesus is saying, my church is unstoppable. Satan can't stop it. Nothing can overpower or silence my church. Not even the power of death itself. The church is not a building, but a community of Christ followers. See, as we share the gospel, as we build each other up in Christ, as we proclaim the gospel to the next generation, it doesn't matter what happens to me, because... Um, I will hopefully um, I will have shared the gospel with my family and so then whenever whenever I die they will just keep they will carry it on and then whenever they have kids they will carry it on and they will carry it on and it doesn't have to be just biological families but we share the gospel uh, we hopefully these youth if they don't know Jesus they will come to know Jesus the church just goes on and on and on until Jesus comes back and then we'll go on forever right Nothing can stop Jesus as he builds his church because he has all authority. He's going to do it. So that's encouraging. So it doesn't, we, again, no matter what laws are passed, no matter what happens, we can be encouraged because we know that Jesus says, I'm going to build my church, I'm going to do it, and nothing is going to stop it. Not even the power of death can stop it. Uh, back in, uh, ba basically, if you go back to Acts 2 and, and the, the story of the early church, it's persecution, persecution, persecution. And, and the Romans thought, we're going to get rid of these guys. They don't worship Caesar. They don't worship the emperor. We're going to get rid of these Christians. And the more they persecute them, the more they just spread out. And the gospel went everywhere. And then it eventually came here, right? We're, we're pretty far from the Middle East. We're pretty far from Palestine, from Jerusalem. But here we are in El Dorado, Arkansas, knowing the Lord Jesus Christ because persecution didn't stop the church. Even when they killed or thought they had killed, they killed Jesus, that didn't stop them. That didn't stop the church. Nothing will stop Jesus as he builds his church. Verse 19, Jesus goes on and says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Here Jesus is giving... so. We could look at Matthew 18, we're not going to, but in Matthew 18, Jesus talks more about the keys to the kingdom and how he's, and what he's doing there. But basically, he's giving authority to his disciples to proclaim his message. He's given authority, and then in, in Matthew 18, we see that he gives authority to the local church. But Jesus isn't walking around nowadays, but, when peop, uh, but he's giving us authority as the church to act on his behalf. But we, uh, it's our job to do that rightly, to preach his word accurately, to administer the ordinances and other things. But he's given us authority to act as he's in heaven. And then verse 20, 
It says, Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Obviously, this is not, <laughs> Jesus didn't want this to, uh, this wasn't the final word. This is just a, a certain situation for his disciples. Um, Jesus wanted people to come to knowledge of his identity as the Son of God based on the right motive. He wanted people to personally repent of their sins and follow him, uh, not because of political gain, right? The, the Jews, they thought whenever Jesus came, they were looking for the Messiah. They thought he was going to be a political zealot that was going to overthrow Rome. And they thought, hey, we're in, like, we're kind of, the, the Jews were just kind of under Roman rule, and they didn't want to be under Roman rule anymore. And so they thought Je this Messiah is going to overthrow all that. But Jesus, he was building a kingdom that's not a political kingdom. Jesus did not seek political power. He was seeking a, a heavenly kingdom. So he wanted people, that's why he said, don't go and tell people. He was basically telling his disciples, I don't want you to go tell people that I'm the Christ yet. I don't want you to tell them that yet. But we know that later he does. In Acts 1.8 specifically, we are to be his witnesses. Acts 1.8, you got that? Uh, says, but you will receive, this is Jesus speaking, Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the end of the earth. So Jesus wants us to be his witnesses. But I wanted to explain that because I just said uh, the second point was that the church is a community of people who proclaim Jesus confidently. And obviously uh, they weren't proclaiming him in verse 20, but later on they did. So the church is a community of people who know Jesus in intimately and proclaim him confidently. So Jesus is building his church, the community of people who know him intimately, that know him rightly, and who are proclaiming him. So that's what, um, so Jesus is talking, again, he's talking about his universal church, but as a local church, if we know Jesus, if, we, if all of us truly know Jesus for who he is, we love him, fear him, um, and when I say fear, I don't mean like afraid fear, but we rightly respect him and, and reverent, rever him and we will proclaim him I, I have no doubt that Jesus will use UBC this local church to build his his big C church right his universal church and so I pray that that would be true of us and uh, I pray that uh, if you're not here that you would know that Jesus is the son of God that he is um, the Messiah the promised one so let's pray and uh, as, as uh, Lisa comes up here and to lead us in a song,